I swear, if you knew what I've gone through to make this podcast happen today, you would be amazed. This has been the most, this has been the most arduous task I've undertaken in a long time. Yeah, first of all, my computer, welcome to Canine Conversations, by the way. Welcome to Canine Conversations. Here we're going to talk about the rescue debacle, which we're talking about a debacle. This is the podcast debacle that I had going on here today, trying to get everything organized, my, my, my Mac Pro, my, not my Mac Pro, my iMac Pro crashes. I can't capture video on it through Final Cut Pro, you know, through importing from the FaceTime camera, can't do it. Tried it with iMovie, can't do it. Tried it with the internal drive, can't do it. External drive, can't do it. So I, I don't know, you know, right now I'm, I'm using the, uh, my camera, my professional camera to record a podcast, which I think is seriously overkill, but um, I don't care. I want to do it for you guys. I'm here. Thank you for your support. Thank you for being here. Thank you for making this podcast one of the top 10 in pets and animals, which I think is fantastic. We've only been doing it for less than maybe a little bit more, but about a half a year. And the podcast is just growing. Um, tons of followers, tons of downloads, tons of subscribers, I guess, whatever you call that. And uh, you know why? Because I think I speak the truth. Other people kind of try to sugarcoat stuff. I may not always be politically correct, but I'm always telling you the truth. So Today we're talking about the rescue debacle. I've got some notes with me, and the reason I'm kind of talking about this is because uh, Janet just came back and was telling me about a friend of hers who rescued a dog and other friends who were rescuing dogs and looking for dogs, and all this stuff goes on. I've been in shelters throughout this country. I love rescue dogs. I love shelters, and I love all the work that rescues do, but there's a few bad apples, and I kind of want to call them out in this podcast. And before I call out the bad apples, I want to call out some of the good apples here locally in L.A., uh, you know, uh, West Side German Shepherd Rescue, uh, German Shepherd Rescue for Orange County, uh, Pay People, Sharpay Rescue. Um, I mean, my friend um, Mel is doing great work with big dogs. We'll talk about all that stuff today. But, you know, really the bad seeds are ruining it for everybody. And that's what we're going to talk about. And th there's some rescues who actually go and buy dogs from breeders off Craigslist and then they, they adopt them out and then they say they're solving the problem because the, the, the breeders won't breed anymore because we bought their breeder dogs and stuff like that. So uh, that makes zero sense to me because, you know, when a, when, a, when a puppy mill or a backyard breeder sells their dog, all they do is go buy another one and then they keep breeding and they get the money from you and keep breeding. That's not the way to shut it down. The way to shut it down is to not let them sell their dog, not allow them to sell their dogs by not buying it, by not supporting them. That's how you put a store out of business. You don't shop there. If you have a store that you know, sells flowers and you, don't, you think the flowers are unethical and you keep buying all the flowers up, they're going to keep buying more flowers and doing what they're doing. So that's what happens when rescues try to step in and shut down breeders by buying their dogs. By, oh, we're going to buy their breeder dogs and then they can't breed anymore. It's, it's idiotic. It doesn't work. So it's a good idea. I know it sounds like a good idea but it doesn't work. So that's one of the big problems. But the main thing I want to talk about here is the issue. There's a couple of main things. The, one of the really main things is I want to talk about this whole idea of rescues who make rescuing impossible. And they're out there, right? They have these eight-page application. They have these exceedingly strenuous home checks. They have these background checks, these interviews, these, it, there's like such an intense process to getting a dog from them that people often then go on Craigslist or something. And, you know, if they talk to me, I tell them to go to a good breeder, but they'll end up on Craigslist. They'll end up ordering a puppy through some puppy mill online and, you know, listen to my podcast on puppy mills. It infuriates me. Puppy mills really infuriate me. But when rescues make it this impossible for a, for a person to buy a, a dog or adopt a dog through a rescue, and then they push them into the arms of the Craigslist breeders and the, and the backyard breeders and the puppy mill breeders online, who's really at fault there? I mean, that's a tough one, right? I mean, that's a tough one to kind of accept and to look into and to understand because this is the rescue failing the dogs. And they do this in, in a couple different ways. So, you know, one way is, Shelters are overflowing with dogs here, overflowing, overflowing with dogs, killing dogs every day. Dogs are being killed. We'll talk about no kill another day. But, you know, shelters are killing dogs because there's no room for them. They become behaviorally unsound. Uh, they break down, they get sick or they're just there's lack of space. So they end up having to kill them for, for those reasons. And these 
rescue organizations step in and then get the dog out of the shelter and it, it then bottlenecks the system. So they're stuck with the dog, the shelter's full, and they won't adopt the dog out because they don't feel it's the right home. And the right home, you know, I mean, let me tell you right now, the right home is a home, is a home with a, a living body and, 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 and a person who's going to care for the dog. How great this home is becomes, beco becomes kind of irrelevant because you only can check so much. People are going to lie, people are going to cheat, people are going to, you know, be dishonest in, in their in their applications. So when I was doing rescue, when I you know I took a couple dogs out of the shelter and trained them and then rehomed them, you know, I was looking for the first good home that came along and I had great luck. I had fantastic luck with it, all the dogs I placed, every single one because I kind of believed in the greater good of people, which I don't really believe that much anymore. I really do believe that these dogs ended up in great homes because I trusted, I believed, and I kind of went through it. Now, if one or two of them would have fallen through and not done it, would I have been upset? Of course I would have been upset, I would have been hurt, but I would look at it that I'm just doing the best I can, and that's, anybody, that's all anybody can do. So when, the, um, when these rescues, you know, I remember this friend of mine here in Malibu, they, they asked these intense questions, and he and his wife were looking to adopt a dachshund, and they, they have had dachshunds forever. They have a really beautiful home, a very opulent home. And the, the rescue came over and looked at their home and wouldn't give them the dog because he had a pool and stairs. I mean, it's idiotic, right? The person has a staff, gardeners, you know, housekeepers, you know, house people, you know, assistants and everything. The dog would never lack for anything, but couldn't get the dog because he had stairs and a pool. And therefore, he went and bought one from a breeder. Now, okay, he bought one from a breeder. Is it the end of the world? No, I think it's a good thing, actually. It's a good breeder he bought it from. But, you know, this rescue dog deserved that home. And in a shelter, most shelters can't ask that many questions, in particular municipal shelters. Now, sometimes that's bad because you'll see some gangbang lowlife guy come in and, you know, rescue a pit bull. And then the breed gets further demolished because you've got these scumbags rescuing these dogs and you know they're going to fight them or they're going to you know, do a wealth of other things and I know it goes on. So when people say, oh, you're being biased on it, I'm not. So, um, you know, th these rescues then make all these e exceedingly um, exorbitant uh, requests upon a person and nobody can adopt the dogs. And then you've got these rescues like some of the ones here in LA who have storefronts and then they're hoarding the dogs. The dogs are in there for a year, two, three, four, sometimes five or six years and the dogs are living in a crate. I mean, oh my God, nothing pisses me off as much as that. I've gone to some of these places and you see it. Some of them don't let you in the back for a good reason because it's, it's so disturbing. But these dogs live in a freaking box. I mean, a crate. They live in the crate 23 hours a day. Maybe they get a walk or two. And man, at this point, I'm all for putting those dogs down because they're suffering so horribly and decaying emotionally, physically, and all that. So <clears throat> it's, it's, just, it's just so disturbing. And it's going on. It's going on with rescues that are nonprofits that are getting tax-free dollars from your donations. So we've got to look at this. We've got to call a spade and call, you know, call a spade a spade on this stuff because these are huge issues. You look at a great rescue like my friend Kim from Shelter Hope Pet Shop. You know, she is and her, her crew, her staff are, are doing the hard work. They're going into shelters. Now, they only deal with small dogs, but they go into shelters. They find these young puppies, these, these small dogs. They get them out. They foster them. They groom them. They care for them. They vet check them and everything. They put them in one of their stores. I think there's three or four of these shelter hope pet shops around now. She's done a fantastic job. And these dogs, yeah, they do a home check, you know, a, 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 an application. But it's, in a, it's a process, and it's a completely able-bodied process to function. It just works because they're doing the right thing. And that's kind of what we need to look for in rescue. That's what rescue needs to model itself after. For example, if rescues want to do the right thing, you know, the, the biggest problem in shelters is going to be pit bulls, shepherds, you know, these big dogs. Want to do the right thing? Start a rescue, take these dogs out, train them, give them solid obedience training and adopt them out into qualified homes and offer the, tra the, the adopters training because that's the problem. Behavioral issues are one of the top things that, that land dogs in shelters. And that's what people don't understand. They think they need to be loved. They need to be trained. They need to understand basic obedience. They need to understand structure and that will save their lives. So 
these rescues aren't doing that. I'm talking about the bad apples. I'm going to talk about as many good ones as bad ones. Uh, my friend Mel has a rescue. She, she, she'll pull a dog out of a shelter, big dogs, massive corsos, pits, uh, rotties, and retrain these dogs. You know, Kyle does it. A lot of these people do it, and they end up really placing good dogs. They, they really work hard. Kyle's done it for 20 some odd years, done a really, really solid job with it, and you know, has taken dogs that nobody else would get. And all the meanwhile, you have the hoarders who, who do the, the horrible, atrocious, atrocious stuff. You know, um, barks and bitches. Shannon does an amazing job. Gets, gets a lot of, I mean, all, all kinds of breeds. Sells them at a store on Fairfax, you know, here in LA. And I think there's stories like this all over, but we're talking about the bad apples. We're talking about the bad seeds. This is my concern. This is what we've got to clean up before we can solve this problem. Because when rescues go into shelters and cherry pick these dogs, they just go and pick these dogs that are, you know, the perfect purebred puppies and take them out and then charge five, six, eight hundred, nine hundred dollars for an adoption fee. It's insanity. It's completely insane. And and this happens. This happens. So they'll, you know, these people will go through shelters and find the best puppies and take them all out. Well, and the reason they call it cherry picking, they're taking the low hanging fruit. The, the issue, the, the, the big, big, big issue with that is all you're leaving in the shelter then is pit bulls, chihuahuas, older dogs, aggressive dogs, and, and dogs nobody wants. So people then know, well, you go to the shelter, all you're going to find are these dogs that nobody wants. If there's some really nice dogs there, if you leave some of these other dogs in the shelter, people will go in for them and more than likely even fall in love with another dog. And they may end up with that old dog, the sick dog, or this dog, or that dog. It's not up to rescues to, be, to play God, to take these dogs out and determine where they go. You've got to work together with, rescu uh, with shelters, with, uh, you know, with, with Humane Society, with these organizations to make this work. It's a team effort. When it becomes all one-sided, it doesn't work. Bernie at A Place to Bark does great work, gets all these dogs out of the South, moves them up through Chicago, through, you know, up, up the East Coast, and does fantastic work. These are really amazing people that do the right thing, and they get thwarted because there's so many others doing bad things that everybody gets lumped into a boat. Don't do that. Look at these organizations that are doing bad work and don't support them. Um, I made some notes here because I always like to have notes when I'm about to talk. There was a, a guy I knew who got into rescue and was really gung-ho with the pit bull situation. He says, everybody should own a pit bull. Well, that's a really stupid idea. Not everybody should own a pit bull. Not everybody should own a dog. But his idea, he said to me, is everybody who comes to me is going to get a pit bull. I don't want to care if they want a shepherd or a poodle or a lab or whatever. They're going to get a pit bull. Well, that's a really bad idea because a pit bull requires a special personality. It requires somebody who's going to be strong with the dog, give the dog structure, understand the behaviors and the drives of that dog, and then you can give the dog a great home. But if you're a kind of a person who's kind of a lab or a poodle personality and you end up with a pit bull, it's a disaster. It's just not going to work out. That's not the right dog for you. For example, Janet is great with labs. She's great with the dachshund, but she'd be a horrible pit bull owner, and she knows that, right? So when you know your weaknesses, you actually embrace your own strength. You strengthen yourself by knowing your weaknesses, and it's just a little bit of wisdom for you guys that you know people need to understand what they can and can't handle. I talk about that at the shelter all the time, that if you're going to take a dog out to train it, to engagement train, to walk it or whatever, know what you're taking out and know your limitations or else you're just screwed. But, um, you know, we were talking about here, okay, ridiculous adoption fees, talked about that. Um, you know, the, the rescues that are doing such great work, I mean, are amazing. But really understand that, you know, things like words like adoption, if you see it on Craigslist, a lot of times it's not. Rescue organizations should have a 501c3, they should be a nonprofit, but not all of them are. That's not the number one thing. They should be doing ethical work. You should be able to get some kind of references on them. And more importantly, 
I want to talk to the rescue organizations who are screwing it up, who are making it bad on good rescue organizations, ones that make adopting a dog completely impossible. If you're holding dogs for a year, two years, three years, and you have applications on these dogs and you're not adopting them out because the home isn't perfect. For example, the person has stairs, the person you know, needs to uh, be home more, the, the person hasn't had a dog before, or whatever, whatever that excuse is, You've got to find a solution to this because if not, these dogs are just, I mean, they're just languishing in the rescue where before they languished in the shelter. I used to tell people if the, once the dog gets out of the shelter, nobody cares about it anymore. You know, people say, well, if the dog's in the shelter, it's going to get killed. We've got to rescue it. We've got to rally. We've got to do this. We've got to do that. Well, you know, when the dog's in a rescue, it, you still need to rally. You still need to get it out. It still needs to get into a home. Good rescue organizations put dogs in foster, take care of medical issues, get the dog basic training, and try to get it out as fast as possible to the best home possible at that time. Yeah, you can wait five years and tr try to find a better and a better and a better and a better home, but at some point those better and better homes start to fizzle out because the dog is getting older and then the dog's going to be emotionally and physically uh, broken and uh, no, the people aren't going to want them. So, and then you get people who, who adopt the dogs because they feel sorry for them. And that's not always the best home for a dog either. So think about that. That's really, really critical. Um, you know, you know the, the, the other thing I've heard rescue organizations do, and I, I worked with a guy, a client of mine, who wanted to, get, uh, he wanted to adopt a lab from a special rescue, let's call it. And the rescue asked him, well, are you going to train the dog? He said, of course I'm going to train the dog. I'm working with, you know, Robert Cabral. And the rescue person said, it's not, a, it's, this, wasn't a, this is not like what you're thinking of, it, but I'm just, anyway. And the person the, at the rescue said, well, are you going to use like metal collars to correct the dog? And he said, yeah, you know, the rescue we had was a shepherd. And he rescued this really crazy shepherd that required some serious training. And the dog's name was Molly. And Molly had the best life with this guy. This guy was an amazing a dog owner after we did some training and he started to understand what the dog needed, became an impeccable dog owner. But anyway, this organization turned him down because he was going to put a choke chain on the dog. I mean, completely idiotic. I mean, just moronically idiotic to, 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 to banish somebody from rescuing a dog because they were going to actually give the dog structure training. And by the way, you know, a choke chain on a dog is going to prevent them from running away as much as it's going to correct the dog for bad behavior. And if the dog doesn't have bad behavior, the dog never receives a correction. But this is that mentality, that, that God mentality, that they're going to control everything, and that's where we get in trouble. That's where we have huge, huge, huge issues. So the last thing I want to talk about um, on the rescues that really piss me off are these, these, um, these uh, like a Titanic rescue. The rescue is so epic. It's so grand. It's so all-consuming that people get wrapped up in it, right? It's... Uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a meat dog from Korea who was rescued from the slaughterhouse. And, you know, as they were closing the slaughterhouse, they're going to slaughter this dog. And this person pulled it off the slaughter line and now it's being rescued. Or, you know, or a, a dog, a street dog that was beaten up and abused and had acid poured on it in Mexico. These are great stories. And, of course, we feel terribly sorry for the dogs. But what happens is we get so wrapped up in the story of this one, two, three dogs that we overlook the fact that right in your backyard, right in your, less than a couple miles from your front door, there's dogs being killed in shelters right there. And that's highly unfair. I always say charity starts at home. I just did a post on social media about this same topic where somebody was rescuing a street dog from Romania and they got the dog and the dog was all screwed up and they can't get the dog to do this and do that. And I kind of went off on one of my rants because that's really upsetting to me, right? They, they rescued this dog, and now maybe they're in Romania. I don't know. But the point is, clean up your own backyard before you start looking at other people's backyards. And that's a huge piece that people don't get. They think, well, the dog's in Romania. The dog has a horrible life. And then they invest countless hours, thousands of dollars to rescue the dog. And in the meantime, they could have rescued a dog in their own backyard. Actually, if you look at the thousands and thousands of dollars you're going to spend on air travel and, and, and transports and all these other things, you could probably rescue five or ten. So when people say it's a life, a life is a life, and it's so important, and if you really believe that, if you really believe a life is a life, 
then don't support rescues that cost thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars for one dog. Take those thousands of dollars and rescue multiple dogs. Go into a local shelter and rescue two, three, four dogs there. Put them into training, put them into, into um, you know, get them, get them the vet care they need and get them into homes because that's what's gonna save their lives. And to do the greater good is what we really should be doing. I remember I was training dogs at shelters, I was working with them, and then I realized that instead of me training them, I could train people to train the dogs. And then I changed my focus and I said, okay, the focus will be training people to train dogs. And through that work with Bound Angels, we've trained hundreds of people from different shelters all over the country who can now go forth and do this work. So rescues who do this cherry picking, who do these, you know, these quasi adoptions, who, who buy out breeders' dogs, and then all the while they criticize breeders and put them down, breeders aren't the problem. Breeders are not the problem at all because some people are going to want a dog from a breeder and they should have an absolute 100% right to do that. It's a free country and I hope you have freedom wherever you live in the world that you should be able to get a dog from where you want to get it from. If you want to get it from a good breeder, be sure it's a good breeder. Be sure it's an ethical breeder with, with health checks, with histories of dogs, with paper dogs. You know, don't just get a dog because it's, you know, oh, it's an AKC dog. That doesn't mean shit. Right? What means something is the fact that you are looking at the overall picture of the dog. How is the breeder treating his dogs? How often does he breed? All these things are super, super important. If you're looking to get a rescue dog, get the right dog for yourself and work with an ethical rescue organization that helps the greater good of dogs, that helps multiple dogs. And like I said, a rescue dog is the perfect dog for 90% of dog owners, or maybe 95% of dog owners, because most people just want a dog to hang out with. If you're looking for a competition dog, a sport dog, a protection dog, you know, something highly, highly special, you're gonna get a dog from a breeder, and it's not the end of the world. It's not gonna create any huge havocs, but you gotta understand what you need and what you're gonna get and what you're gonna what you're willing to put forth to get it. Do the best you can. Nobody should be criticizing you. If they do, have them come talk to me. I like talking to people like that. Hey, I'm gonna answer a couple questions here. I gotta put my glasses on because I gotta read these questions. So um, I, I'm way behind on my questions, so this will give me a chance to catch up here. My dog, uh, Nina, says, My dog lately started howling at some people. I correct her, but she still continues. She's a Malinois, 10 months old. I'm afraid this won't progress this won't progress in something worse. Or you're afraid it's going to get worse. And you're probably right. Um, again, Malinois, tough breed. A tough breed to get, and you should really get some good, solid obedience training. The, dog, the reason the dog is probably doing it is probably the dog is unfamiliar, is not properly socialized, but the dog is going to need to understand structure and respect you. If the dog respects you, he's going to listen to you. He's going to do the right thing by you, but without training, the dog doesn't know what you want. Next question. Milton says, where did you get your tug toys at? I love those, I can't find them. Can you give me a link to the site? What store? On the East Coast. Um, so, okay, thank you, love your videos. Okay, so the thing is here, the, the tug toys I use are all French linen tugs, the, the, or they're called linen tugs. Some, some people call them French linen tugs. I like those the best because they seem to be, the, they have the best texture for the dog's mouth, the teeth, they don't do as much damage on the teeth as some of the jute toys. You can't use them over and over and over every single day because it will kind of start to wear down the dog's teeth. But you can get them online, you can get them at Learberg, you can get them at Blue Collar Working Dog. Just check online. Clint, uh, ABC Clin makes great ones. Julius Canine makes really good ones. Julius Canine, I think you can get them almost anywhere. They have really good, good tugs. I would use those. Kara says, I need concrete help. I'm not a contractor, but I'm going to try to help you anyway. How do you stop a dog from barking at certain dogs' people when they walk past your front yard? Unavoidable area where distance won't help. When walking just us, he does well, but when another dog and owner comes within a few, within view, my dog barks and gets overly excited. He also loves to chase cars in a fence in the yard. How do I stop this behavior? 15-month-old Cocker Spaniel. You're dealing with prey drive. You're dealing with a dog who's super excited, who's super uh, play-oriented. You know what you might want to do is if you can keep the dog inside and not let him run in that front yard, that's going to help you immensely. Also, you want to consider not letting the dog meet other dogs right away if the dog doesn't have some solid focus on you, some solid obedience, because it's this prey drive. That's why he's chasing cars or bicycles or anything like that. And you're going to need to um, contain the dog. You can't just have this dog running back and forth in the yard. Dog's going to get crazy. It's going to really tick off another dog, and then you're going to have a fight, and that's not going to be good at all. So um, 
control, you know, obedience. A 15-month-old dog is, you better get on it soon. Let's see here. Dave says, your videos are helpful and informative. I had a question about crate training. You said to start with the dog being in the crate for short time periods and without locking the door. So if bringing the pup home for the first time, do you suggest placing him in the crate that night when it's time for bed? If not, how should a new pup be housed? And should the crate be placed in an area so the pup can see its new owners? Another video with Dwayne as a puppy shows him doing a lot of jumping up on you when you first start to shape behaviors. At what point is the jumping behavior no longer acceptable? How is it? So it's a lot of questions today, but let's start with the crate training. First of all, the crate training, yeah, make sure the dog is nice and tired. If you're going to get the dog first day, take the dog nice for a nice long walk. Make sure the dog has relieved itself. Put the dog in a crate for three or four hours. Take the dog out after three or four hours. Let it relieve itself again. Put it back in there. Set the precedent on day one. Don't make the mistake of saying, well, day one, I'm going to let it sleep in my bed or on the floor or whatever, and then put it in the crate. That's absolutely cruel because the dog's going to think, wow, this is great. I get to sleep in a bed and then wonder what he did wrong when he has to sleep in a crate. And letting the dog sleep in a bed or on a floor at night when you're asleep and hopefully you're a sound sleeper, you're setting yourself up for a huge, huge disaster. Don't do it. Crate the dog. You're going to be much, much happier in the long run. Gabby Hernandez says, just got a six-week-old six German Shepherd puppy. How, do, how soon should I start training? Six weeks old. I don't know why you got a puppy that young. That's really, really young. I wouldn't really... Um, Get a dog that young, should be a seven or eight weeks when you're getting it, but you should start training at day one. That's it. Day one, dog comes home, dog starts training. That's the end of the discussion. Eddie Betty. Hello, sir. I'm looking into getting a Dogo Argentino five-month-old pup. I'm curious if he's too old to socialize or train being five months. I want to give him, my dog the best life, and I want the best I can. So first of all, Dogos are super, super hard, strong dogs. Some people are going to say, oh, mine's a mush pie. Great. But for the most part, this breed is super intense. And I don't really recommend the breed for most people in the world. Just like I don't recommend Malinois for most people, but Dogo Argentines, even less so. It's a super hard breed. I like them. I think they're beautiful. But it's not a dog I would own or I would really suggest to own. I don't know why you're looking at that breed. But if you are and you are an experienced dog owner, then you will know that five months old is not too late to start training the dog. Um, you hopefully will have a puppy that was socialized way before five months. Because if it wasn't socialized now and now you're just starting to socialize it, it's going to be a little bit of a task. It can still be done. But the dog needs to have all solid experiences. Super, super, super important. Last question. Wasim Chamak. Who's the best? Me. Prong collar or choke chain collar? Well, first of all, they're two different collars. They, they serve two completely different purposes. You need to look at what you need and why you want it, um, for what purpose, for what kind of training. But they're both very, very important. They're very, very functional. They, they serve many, many different purposes. Some dogs don't respond well to prong collars, so we keep them on a choke chain. Some dogs will choke themselves out on a choke chain, will do well on a prong collar read the dog, figure out the dog, and go from there. I'm going to do this one last question because it's the only one left on my list. Um, it's a long one, too. I don't want to get too wordy on it, but anyway. Pat says, my wife and I adopted a mixed breed dog from a shelter about six months ago, and we have found your videos very helpful. He's now two years old and 50 pounds. For the most part, Ale is a happy, playful, energetic dog, willing to learn, loves everyone. However, you guys got to keep these questions a lot shorter, please. He exhibits some strange behavior at 10 or 11 every night. No, by then I'm asleep, so I couldn't even help you with that one. When I'm getting ready for bed, he gets very excited and anxious, will run in front of me and nip at my toes when I'm turning off the light. When we had our Christmas trip, I would try to water it before bed, and he would crawl in front of me, and if I had tried to physically move him, he would growl and show his teeth. He'll do the same thing if I get down and look under the couch or something. I can't stop him from doing this by telling him to sit and stay while I do things he'd get in the way of, but I feel... Like, that's not addressing the issue. Oh, you, okay, you can get him to do it, but, okay, but you're not addressing the issue. I exercise him, fetch, running, hiking, and work on training him every day. We haven't been crating him because he's never destructive. Can you give me some insight as to what's going on? Well, you know, I don't know if that behavior of him showing his teeth and growling at you is aggressive. A lot of dogs, from what it sounds here, if he's not biting you, this might be the way he plays and the way he initiates play. When Goofy and Dwayne play, he shows his teeth. A lot of times when Goofy plays tug with me, he shows his teeth because that's just the way he plays. So you need to figure out, this is a really important component, you need to figure out if he is being aggressive, then you need to, to really focus on structure because that's not permissible. But if this is the way he plays, you need to identify that as his, as his methodology of play or his style of play and, and work with that. So you're not giving me enough information, but 
I don't think it's aggressive because if, if at, this le at this stage here, he would have bitten you, to me, I, it sounds like that to me. I don't know 100%. But to me, it sounds more like this is his style of play. You need to identify it and you need to work with it. And that's that. So that's it for this edition of Canine Conversations. Thank God I finally got one done. I'm going to put this up. I've got, I've got to get to bed. It's, it's so late for me. And uh, I want to thank you. Thank you so much for subscribing to my podcast. I'm so grateful to all of your support. Uh, thank you for those of you who are members of my membership section, my website at robertcabral.com. Great new updates every single week, a new video, something going on, something super great going on there. Check my YouTube channel, Facebook, follow me on Instagram, follow me everywhere. Thanks for being a part of this. And thank you for letting me be a part of making your life with your dog the best life it can be. I'll see you next week.